Hi, everyone, and welcome. Thank you for coming. Um, we're here today to talk about communicating climate change science. This is the sixth and final event for the year of the um, Research Without Borders series, sponsored by the Scholarly Communication Program at Columbia and also by the Earth Institute. We have um, three panelists, and plus our moderator. So I'll introduce Robin Bell, the moderator. She's a senior research scientist at the Lamont Doherty Earth Observatory, and she specializes in the stability of ice sheets and how ice sheets are changing. And she'll introduce our panelists. Thank you very much for coming. Oh, and I should also say we're videotaping. Uh, we'll have a Q&A session after everyone speaks. And if you have a question, please step up to the mic in the middle of the audience so we can get your question on audio. Thank you. Bye. OK, thank you, everybody, for coming today. I'm Robin Bell. I work at the Institute, if you don't know. It's about 15 miles up the river, not Sing Sing, but up on a cliff. It's where a lot of the climate and earth science research at Columbia happens. And why this is a, a fascinating topic to have here is this is exactly the topic that we talk about at lunch a lot. We're you know, a community of about 400 people studying the Earth. And we sit down at the cafeteria. What we talk about is how do we communicate science and the science of our changing planet to our peers and to the public and to policymakers. So that's why this is a wonderful discussion to be having in this forum today. So the, the structure is going to be we're going to hear from each of our three panelists. They're going to talk for about 20 minutes. We aren't going to take questions immediately afterwards, so we're going to hear everything we have to say from climate modelers to visualization to data to what people think about climate. And then we're going to have questions and a dialogue. So that's the plan. And we're going to start first with Gavin Schmidt, who's a climate modeler at NASA GIS, which is just down the street. He also is one of the um, editors of Real Climate, which you may have been to. He got his degrees in mathematics and really is interested in how to model the changing climate. So first, we're going to hear from Gavin. OK, uh, thank you very much for coming. And um, no. So I'm, I'm, I'm just going to talk. And, uh, and if I repeat myself, just, just kind of growl at me or something, and I'll, I'll, and I'll shut up. I'm also try, going to try and be uh, quite brief because uh, I think in forums like this uh, we can gain a lot more by actually responding to questions that people have rather than just uh, sitting up here and pontificating about what we think. Pontificating, a bad word this week. Anyway, um, Let me talk a little bit about climate science. Uh, I'm not going to talk about the science. Um, you, know, you can go and read my papers. You can ask me offline. Um, you can check out my blog, Real Climate, if you want to do that. You can buy my book, which is all about the science. Um, but I'm going to talk about the environment in which climate science is being done. Um, you would have had to have been living under a rock the last six months uh, if you were not aware of the fact that climate science has become intensely politicized. Um, this is the kind of thing that happens whenever people perceive that there is a threat to either their political view, their religious view, their ethical view, their moral stance from something that's coming out of the scientific community. This is not unique to climate science. It's something that occurs with evolutionary biology. It's something that occurs with fishery science. It's something that occurs um, really whenever uh, science is, is seen to impinge upon uh, something that, that people are much more closely tied to than the scientific method. So uh, people are much more wedded to their political opinion about how markets work, for instance, or their view of uh, uh, their right to burn fossil fuels uh, whenever and however much they want uh, than they are to uh, you know, integrity in paleoclimate studies. This has led to um, a very clear scientization of the politics. That's not my word. That, that comes from Daniel Sarowitz. Um, and it describes the phenomena by which you're going to turn on Fox News and you're going to hear a lawyer and a politician arguing about 15th century tree rings. Now, neither of those people know anything about 15th century tree rings. And so, uh, but that's just a cover for their um, desire to have an argument uh, about really their values, and their values are all usually political or ethical, um, but kind of couch it in the, in, in, in the language of science 
uh, in order both to try and overwhelm their opponent, who knows as little about science as they do, uh, but also in order to give their arguments a veneer of scientific respectability. Uh, despite what's happened over the six months, scientists are far, far more trusted in the general public than our journalists, than our politicians, than our lawyers. And so if you're a lawyer or a journalist or a politician, it's much better to sound like a scientist than it is to sound like a journalist, a lawyer, or a politician. The, the consequence of these events, or, or, or of this, this environment, um, is that the media doesn't generally uh, see the whole picture. They generally see the science and they look at the science, the stuff that's going on in the, in the peer-reviewed literature, the stuff that's in the IPCC report or in the CCSP reports, uh, and they pass it for things that they think are of interest in the public debate. Now, the public debate is completely divorced from the scientific debate. So the scientific debate, you know, we have whole conferences talking about exactly how to reconstruct climate uh, in the medieval period. We have whole conferences on the interactions of aerosols and clouds and the microphysics that goes on at those points. Those are the things that people in the scientific community are debating. The public debate is what to do about emissions, what to do about climate policy, what to do about energy policy. Those are very different things. Uh, but the science is only looked at uh, in the public sphere to the extent that it projects onto this public debate. Now, the media's idea about what the scientific debate is completely determined by the public debate and not by the science. And so you end up with stories making news or events making news not on their intrinsic scientific merits, uh, but on to what extent they project onto this public debate. That's a very distorted view of what goes on in the science. Um, one of the other elements that is problematic uh, in the media environment is the fact that the media reports on news, and that's not a problem, that's just who they are, they report news. Uh, things like, well, we've known that carbon dioxide is a greenhouse gas for over 100 years now. Well, that's not news, right, because it's 100 years old. Uh, and so things that everybody knows, the vast amount of tacit knowledge that all of the scientific community holds, none of that is ever news, okay? So none of that ever gets reported by the media. Instead, we have a focus on the studies that, fo that seem to project onto this public debate, or the things that come out in nature or science every week. Uh, the one or two papers that, that get press attention there um, are, are read, distilled to you know, a lead paragraph and a headline uh, that generally completely distorts what it is that has been found in that paper or why that paper was ever in nature or science in the first place. What's missing is the context. Why is that paper important? Um, there's no room for that, because by the time you've explained what a greenhouse gas is, you know, you're already at the limit of your words. One of the, uh, the interesting contrasts that uh, I like to point out to people is how much more information there is in a sports column than there is in a science column. Go to any newspaper and you find a story about science, and then you flip to the back of the paper and you look at a story about sports. The sports column doesn't bother to tell you what game they're playing. It doesn't tell you who these teams are, where this, play, where this is going on, or what the rules are, or anything. They just say, Joe of this team did this, this, and this, and you know, it's completely impenetrable for somebody who has no idea what they're talking about. Um, in a science column, they feel they have to explain everything. And so the information content for sports readers is much, much higher than the information content for science readers. So, when you're reading the media, when you're, when you're observing this as just a lay person who knows that there's something interesting going on, who knows that this is a complex situation, you're intensely frustrated pretty much on a continual basis. Um, you know that it's more complicated than you're being told. You don't know where to go for more information. If somebody points you to the technical literature, quite frankly, that's impenetrable to anybody who hasn't studied this for a long time. The focus in the media is almost all wrong. The focus is, say, 90% on these very cutting-edge uh, studies, which quite often are wrong um, or not replicated in the end, 
or on things that project onto what they perceive to be the public debate. And so you get 90% of the coverage on that and only 10% on the basic background knowledge that is really informing our advice to policymakers and to everybody else that says, well, you know what? We think that emissions should be uh, reduced. Uh, if, you think of, if you think of science like a building, um, think of climate science like a building, it has foundations that stretch back 100 years. Um, there are multiple stories. The whole superstructure is, uh, is all there and in place. And the stuff that the media is paying attention to is people arguing about whether it's a blue brick or a yellow brick right at the top, or what color wallpaper we should put in the executive bathroom on the top floor. Those are interesting, I guess, for interior decorators and for um, you know, uh, experts in, in brickery. Uh, but they're not uh, the building. They're not the whole thing. And when you step back away from the, kind of the minutiae of the scientific debate, uh, all you see is that big building, and that's what people should be talking about, and yet that's the thing that doesn't get discussed at all. Now, over the last few months, uh, there's been a bit of a, a, you could call it a perfect media storm. Uh, the release of the stolen emails from the UEA server, uh, the failure in Copenhagen to, uh, to come to any kind of meaningful uh, agreement, um, and the fact that it was snowy in, uh, in Washington, D.C. Um, you laugh, but I'm pretty sure that if you did a correlation between how people felt about global warming uh, with the, the, uh, the, the last three months of, uh, of climate in, uh, in D.C., you'd find a pretty, hard, a pretty high correlation. Um, it was snowy in D.C., but it turns out you know, that January, February, and March are the warmest uh, months on record. This year is very likely to be the warmest year on record globally. Um, but again, nobody's paying attention to that. So um, what went on? You had these three kind of you know, elements that were all kind of feeding a particular narrative. And because the accusations that were running around after those emails uh, were released, released, <laughs> um, stolen. Uh, by the way, my emails were included in those, so feel free to go and check out everything that I've been saying over the last 13 years, even in private. Um, the, the news media didn't know where to go, right? The people that they'd normally thought of as credible were the people being accused of all sorts of malfeasance and scientific misconduct, so they couldn't go to them. Um, the fact is that there aren't huge numbers of credible scientists who disagree with the consensus on this. And so they went to the only place they could go, which were the fringe elements, the people who've been going around for years saying, oh, climate change is a hoax, and we're all involved in some giant conspiracy, and everything that we do is designed to, uh, to force some kind of new communist, socialist, vegetarian utopia on everybody else. Um, so what that did is it opened uh, what's called the, the uh, this, this is quite an interesting concept, called the Overton window, which is the, the window or the, or the barriers to which uh, what it's permissible to talk about in public. So if you think back over the healthcare debate, um, nobody really uh, serious was able to talk about socialized medicine like they have in Europe or in Canada or, or anywhere else uh, because that's off the table here. Right? In Europe, a system like we have here is also off the table. And so discussions about healthcare in Europe and in the US don't have any overlap at all, right? because the window of permittable opinions in the mainstream media is, is just very much more constrained on one side in Europe than it is uh, here. Now, those barriers can switch and shift, and what happened in the last three months is that, the, is that the window for permissible opinions about climate science shifted all the way to the nutters. Now, and I, I don't use that word lightly, um, though I was quoted saying that in the New York Times the other week, and I got a whole slew of, uh, of, of irate messages. So how dare you call me, call me a nutter? And I had no idea who that person was, so obviously uh, it wasn't clear that I called him a nutter. But there are, there are nutters out there. There are people who are absolutely convinced 
that every word that I'm telling you today, every word that I've ever written in any paper is a lie and a deliberate falsification, okay? It's very hard to talk to these people, <laughs> as you might imagine. A dialogue with somebody who thinks that uh, everything you say is, is dishonest is, is rather difficult. Uh, but these people were given free reign in the media. Their points uh, were treated seriously by mainstream news journalists, not, not necessarily by the environmental beat reporters uh, who have a, uh, a longer relationship with the community and who know who the players are and they know who's credible and who's not credible. Uh, but the New York Times, for instance, you know, quoted uh, you know, people who have absolutely no credibility uh, well, what's your opinion of, of climate science? And, and you know, go, like, why are they asking these people? Because they didn't have anybody else to turn to. So, one of the things, well, so it's okay. So, let me, the, 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 I think the other speakers are going to tell us what it is that we need to be doing about this. But let me leave you with um, a couple of thoughts that have arisen out of uh, the, last, uh, the last few months. One of the things to be aware of is that the things that we worry about a lot, what we talk about over lunch in the Lamont cafeteria, for instance, these are not the preoccupations of the majority of the population. Um, despite everything that went on uh, with the Climate Gate uh, affair, most people, if you go outside of a very small uh, group of people who are tuned into this kind of stuff, most of it went completely over the heads of most people. Um, science as a whole uh, is, is not going to be damaged by these things. The window for what's permissible in discussions of climate science is slowly closing back to what it was uh, before that. But that's not to say that we've done a good job with communicating climate change or the science. We've done a terrible job. Um, it's basically because it's not our job. <laughs> that's, that's a big problem. Um, but if you, if you look at how deeply people understand the concepts that we're dealing with here, the fact that carbon dioxide accumulates in the atmosphere and, and progressively makes a, a larger and larger problem, uh, the fact that um, the ozone hole is not necessarily the same thing as, as, as global warming, uh, even when people agree that something should be done, their reasoning for why something should be done is very, is very poor. And, it, and, it, and it's a kind of a veneer. It's, it's a very, uh, if, if you try and probe people's level of knowledge, it's, it's very thin. Um, and this predates anything to do with, uh, with the, last, uh, the last six months. Our ability or, or our capability of explaining to people why science is trustworthy why the scientific method works, why the process that we go through as individuals in this competitive environment, in the technical literature, why that has any credibility, that's where we fail. And I don't think that that's a particularly difficult thing to get across to people. Anybody who's watched a version, uh, an episode of CSI knows, okay, they, they know that you can get a DNA analysis in 10 seconds, um, but, but, but more deeply, they know what it is to try and find a balance of evidence argument in a complex situation where you have only imperfect knowledge about what's going on. And if somebody can understand the threads within an episode of CSI, they can understand what it is that scientists are doing with respect to climate change. Um, so I'm just gonna, I'm gonna leave you with that thought and then these people are gonna tell me that I have no idea what I'm talking about. So to, to, uh, to the next people, thank you. Okay, thank you Gavin for your perspective on the last six months and how we as scientists do or don't communicate science very well. Um, Next, we're going to hear from Ned Gardner, who got his PhD in um, landscape ecology, and then went on to work for the American Museum of Natural History in producing video bulletins and actually really working on communicating science. And is now taking his fascination of using images and data, actually moved to NOAA, where he's working on the, basically how, 
how do we communicate climate to and climate change to the public? So, Ned, we're looking forward to hearing your insights on this. And I'm not going to refute anything that Dr. Schmidt just said. Um, I sympathize completely, and I think no one will be surprised if there are some common themes, I think, among the panel, but it should be noted we didn't really coordinate our messages, but we have been thinking about these things because we're being barraged in the media and by society to respond to, really, the culture wars. That's what this boils down to. And um, we sort of have uh, two images of scientists in our culture. One is a dedicated, hardworking, highly intelligent, selfless individual who stays up late every night and on works weekends, never goes to movies, ultra nerd, really focused on understanding complex things, and um, also happens to be providing information that could be useful to us if we were to take advantage of it and put it in the context of our decisions that we're making. We have another image, though, of scientists that's being actively promulgated, of conniving and clever people in some geo-conspiracy, uh, sort of a scientific mafiosa <laughs> attitude to, uh, and they're hell-bent on misanthropic and mean-spirited plans to change how we live. And um, frankly, I've never been able to relate to that second perspective in any way. Um, my man mentors in life are dedicated scientists who much more closely uh, fit that first category, and it really surprises me that there are people in society that do hold that second opinion. But thinking it's bad is not going to make it go away. It does exist, and it is a problem we have to deal with in our society. So the, I think there is some uh, work being done to bridge this gap that's worth um, pointing out. Um, and it, is, it comes from the Cultural Cognition Project uh, at the Yale Law School. This is just one example among dozens around the world you can find that are very high quality social science. And Sabina's going to talk more about social science after me. Um, and um, so, but I just want to allude to this one study because I think it does focus on the right uh, issue, which is how do we frame discussions so that people can hear what the science is telling us. And um, in, in this project, they're looking at major societal issues, dozens of them. One of them happens to be climate change science. And in, a, in one of their research projects, they took samples of, popu of their population and gave different samples, different messages. One was an article in which um, they established the basic record of the surface temperature record of Earth and show that anthropogenic warming is happening and that we could solve this problem through anti-pollution measures. They gave another subsample of pop the population the same basic facts and established that we could use nuclear power to redress anthropogenic global warming. And what they found is that with random samples of people, that you actually had more people who self-identify as individualists and hierarchical, basically beaver cleaver types, believing the facts of global warming when given the nuclear power option versus if you told them we need regulation. And it really does come down to values and the decisions people want to make determine really influencing the messages they're willing to hear. So we may not like knowing that, but I think it's a tool that we can use to understand how to establish dialogue. Not manipulate people, but establish dialogue around solutions in ways that people are going to be comfortable. And that's um, sort of a set of realizations that I've been working at uh, weaving into my own uh, efforts in visualization. So I'm going to present three examples of how I use, have been using visualization uh, over the recent years um, and focusing mostly on climate issues, because that's my job now. Um, but um, 
In my previous career, I was at the American Museum of Natural History down the street on um, uh, right off Central Park West. And we took scientific data, worked very closely with NASA, in fact, and NOAA, um, to really give people the details of the science. So in this, this set of examples, I'm going to talk about communicating the science and getting to the scientific principles. Now, necessarily, we have to come up with messages and ways of communicating scientific concepts that people can understand. Because the fact is, we don't have a society of PhDs in physics. We have to communicate with people uh, if we want them to understand the science. So, um, so we learn things like people don't know what colors mean. When you look at data, so scientists know what, how to read a color scale in the lower right hand corner and establish that there's a relationship between the colors in the scale and the colors on the globe. And that those mean departures of temperature from average conditions in the ocean. So there's a whole subtext that we don't have to explain. Um, well, that went fast. Uh, there's a lot of subtext that we don't have to explain when talking among scientists that we have to explain when talking to other people outside of our discipline. Um, now, the last frame of that, which didn't stay up, sort of showed you some of the impacts of El Nino around the world, one of which is moisture is more uh, precipitation in the southern and eastern United States. So um, we are in an El Nino now. It's weakening, but this is one of the factors that contributed to uh, this winter's um, heavy snowfall. What happens is that the warmer ocean temperature in that region that I was pointing out in the previous visualization leads to higher evaporation, and that has a, is called a teleconnection, where that moisture is carried in the atmosphere over into the southern and eastern United States, carrying with it more moisture that falls as precipitation. So being in an El Nino is a factor for what we experience this winter in terms of more moisture, and the NOAA attribution team has has been looking at this issue closely. Another factor in this winter's temperature has been the Arctic Oscillation. So here you're looking at a map which has several things on it. The colors represent deviation of temperature from average condition. This was observed in early February. This is February 1 to 11. Uh, and these are reanalysis data where the temperature in red are warmer than average and the blue colors are cooler than average. And what you see in February was that we had uh, cooler than average conditions in the central and eastern United States, much warmer than average conditions in much of the Arctic. That cool temperature also extended into Europe and northern Asia. Um, well, it turns out that that's pretty much what happens whenever you have an Arctic oscillation in the phase it's in now, which is a negative phase. So this is just a geophysical concept. And um, combined with El Nino, you get this pattern. So this is 30 years of data represented in one image showing effectively the same patterns. And this is what we see on our planet when the conditions we experience this year happen. It's in our record, and we can document it and show it to you. So that's one way visualization can help establish a frame of reference to show what we understand about the climate system. Now, it turns out that um, the Arctic Oscillation and El Nino, both factors, are consistent with what we experienced this winter. But what we experienced this winter isn't consistent with our projections from, from global coupled ocean atmosphere models. So in this case, we have, um, and by what I'm trying to get at is that this is not a prediction of those models that we would experience this. So in this case, this is about the variability of the weather climate system. So separating variability, this is what our attribution team came up with. So we, we'll get back to it. Um, we'll get back to it. Um, and in fact, we have um, a record that establishes the North Atlantic Oscillation observations, which is the difference in pressure between this region of the Atlantic and this region. And what we see is that this year we were in a very negative phase of the North Atlantic Oscillation, 
which was um, atypical in our record. And in the last decade or two decades, we've really been in more of a positive phase overall. This is very washed out, but what I was just showing you is sort of snapshots of climate-driven weather events from the, win from the winter. This is a snapshot of the close of 21st century climate under one scenario that coupled ocean atmosphere models suggest. Um, if a whole suite of assumptions are true, you can see, you would see if this wasn't washed out, that pretty much the whole planet is in this warmer than average uh, condition. And we, given that you can't really read the image, I think I just want to point out that there are just two sp very small patches in the Arctic and Antarctic oceans where we see cooler than average conditions. And that's due to changes in ocean circulation patterns that are projected under um, continued greenhouse gas warming. Assuming that we peak at 9 billion and drop off, at our emissions drop off, as we, even as we convert to new energy technologies. So we can come back to modeling. I hope we will. You can definitely see more examples of visualizations of this type through NOAA, through NASA, um, through the American Museum of Natural History. Um, I wanted to briefly also, though, talk about some examples of using visualization, maybe focusing on the crossover to societal issues. So um, in Copenhagen, we had a five-foot diameter sphere, science on a sphere, hanging in the public space that the United States had for delegates, visitors, press, anyone walking through the hall. And here you see director of the Earth Systems Research Lab, Sandy McDonald, describing the same model projections I was just showing you uh, a still image of. Um, we produced a, um, a movie that was in 23 languages that sort of established some of the themes of the conference. Um, what climate change is, the challenges it represents, and why it's important that we come up with solutions. Now, obviously, I'm glad you mentioned COP15. It didn't lead to any substantial agreements. Um, but also at COP15 offsite, sort of guerrilla style, I was volunteering with 350.org on my own time, um, doing science outreach, helping people who were there as NGO delegates and student delegates, people who were there really more as political, uh, trying to exert political pressure, giving them some understanding of the Earth system, and um, just leave you perhaps with some of their thoughts. This dome here rocks. You know, everybody should be in it. The visualization you have in the dome. Is a, is a good thing because uh, people do not understand reports and figures. So a uh, seed like you have here have a tremendous uh, effect on, on the human mind. It was really good. Everyone should see this. It was very inspiring. Come from London, mm -hmm. just uh, had a nice lie down in the geodome and uh, treated to some well information that we all know about, but presented in a really clear way. Uh, really interactive sort of way, a way which is engaging. I just say it's exactly what we need to create the paradigm shift in society that we really need at the moment. I think it's fantastic. I love being reminded how unique planet Earth is. It's a really brilliant idea to get some get perspective. Quite an overwhelming experience in a lot of ways, but it's it's brilliant. I think it's an amazing, amazing idea. Well, this is my second time. I came, uh, I was here for the first time yesterday and I was just blown away. I thought it was really powerful. Reaffirmed how like, interconnected we are and how we're all stardust and how friggin' awesome it is.
the third example, I sort of had three examples. One, traditional science directly taking on trying to explain science to people using visualization as a tool, the same way scientists use visualization to understand their data, represent their data. Um, the second example, which I didn't get to show you, was how we were representing Earth system science in, at COP15 in the United States official presence at COP15. And this third example speaks more directly to the affective, sort of how people experience and understand things, what they respond to. And we've designed programming that, get, that ties together uh, the cosmic, the global, and local issues um, in an experience that people can really see the relevance of all these different scales in one immersive experience. And we're building a network nationally of people through museums doing this kind of work because we've realized that it's really this, the experience of seeing Earth systems that's going to, it, that is more effective in reaching people and getting away from these, uh, these diametrically opposed, politically motivated viewpoints. We can just focus on facts by establishing really a new frame of reference. And that's what kind of keeps me in visualization, keeps me inspired. Say one more yes, thing. one more thing to say. I, and, and this is directly because of the nature of the political atmospheres. I am a contractor for NOAA, and I don't speak for NOAA. I do need to say that when I speak in public. <laughs> Okay, now we've had the political disclaimer. Uh, on, uh, here, I thought I had another one. <laughs> Thanks, Ned. Well, now we've had sort of from the, you know, Gavin's experience as the scientist and a spokesman in the science community, and we've had Ned who's working on how to try to figure out how to visualize those complex things that we do, you know, the, the pictures that I spend all my life, you know, pouring at images, and as I say, my head's underneath the ice sheet often. It's not really a very useful place to, describe what I'm carrying around in my head doesn't really help people understand things, even though it might be useful. But what we're gonna hear from next is Dr. Sabrine Marx, who is the Associate Director for a very interesting institute here, which is the Center for Research on Environmental Decisions. So now we're moving from, you know, the, you know, the true card-carrying um, physical scientist, actually to what Ned was alluding to, was actually the social science, how people learn, how people understand, and how we can better understand how to communicate planet. So. So uh, I will talk a little bit about um, why climate change communication is so difficult, uh, or seems to be so difficult, and why has it been um, somewhat unsuccessful in motivating people to change their behavior. And uh, it's really great to see uh, what Ned has presented, uh, that visualization has come a really long way uh, from the initial um, uh, images of climate change and charts and graphs uh, to something that's much more animated and much more engaging that people want to go back to twice to see it as uh, the one um, uh, participant reported. Um, so uh, we have learned quite a bit from the decision sciences uh, from cognitive and social psychology that we can apply to this context of climate change communication. And um, the research at our Center for Research on Environmental Decisions and other places that study these issues um, show that there are great barriers and limits to our decision-making processes. And um, I'll uh, share a subset of topics and problems that we tackle at CRED and offer some solutions as to how to improve climate change communication uh, and how to eventually improve our decision-making processes and uh, behavior. Um, so I'll start with um, some of the main barriers. Um, the first one and probably most important one is uncertainty. Um, people find uncertainty uncomfortable. We all, human, humans have a great need for predictability. Uh, we want to know what the weather's like tomorrow. We want to know how things work. We want to have um, uh, some certainty as to what our life is going to be like um, tomorrow and in the future. Um, so uh, there's uncertainty about nature, and science itself is actually one effort to uh, reduce uncertainty about nature. So it's, it's one, one sign of our human need for, for predictability. We, in, we created science. 
Um, so there's science about nature, there's, uh, there's uncertainty about nature, there's also uncertainty about um, um, in, inherent in the forecasts, uh, forecasts about climate uh, change predictions, forecasts about climate variability, El Nino, La Nina uh, conditions. And um, these are making us uncomfortable. Um, but then there's also uncertainty as to the solutions that are being proposed that would uh, mitigate climate change. Um, there are unintended consequences associated with greenhouse gas um, emission strategies or emission reduction strategies. So um, uncertainty as to um, who will adopt these strategies and who will not adopt them. So there's this uh, social uncertainty as to will I be the only one, am I the, uh, the early adopter who will be isolated or will I regret that I adopted when no one else adopts. And in those cases, coordination is needed and uh, very badly needed. Um, then a second barrier is um, public risk perceptions and attitudes. Um, perceptions matter and they often matter more than facts. And um, public perceptions um, is what politicians uh, look to. Uh, they look to their constituencies and they will not want to implement any policies that will not be accepted by, uh, by their constituencies. So in order for um, policies aimed to reduce carbon emissions um, uh, or to reduce our carbon footprint um, for, the, for them to be implemented, politicians want to know that they fall on, for, on, on open ears. Um, but climate change is very often seen as a very distant problem, spatially and, uh, spatially and uh, temporarily a distant problem. It happens far in the future and it happens to people in places far away from us. So, um, and that's not the thing that gets people excited uh, to take action. So, in order to get people's attention, we should try to, um, to create something that's more tangible and, if possible, show possible local impacts of, of climate change. And one example to do this is like to, um, we can refer back to the uh, 2003 uh, power outage uh, caused by uh, major heat wave where thousands of people had to walk across the Brooklyn Bridge because the subway system was shut down and um, people suffered um, uh, uh, heat, uh, uh, heat stroke and uh, elevators were out, people were complaining, not being able to get into their apartments, etc. So this is one example of uh, possible local impacts of increasing global temperatures. Uh, another way is like um, looking at sea level rise uh, how it might affect uh, New York City. And um, I don't want to say that we have to localize um, everything. It's just like, uh, and we do not want to distract from global warming as a global problem that will affect the entire globe. Um, but in order to get attention, we might want to point out some of the local, possible local impacts. Um, another barrier is myopia. Our um, cognitive short-sightedness magnifies the immediate costs and sacrifices associated with environmentally responsible behavior. Um, for instance, we're much happier um, uh, in our cold or freezing apartment or office. Uh, we do not want to reduce the temperature or increase the temperature uh, in our room now to suffer just a little bit. Um, uh, we're less likely to do that, uh, but we don't care about possible power outage uh, that will occur like tomorrow morning or uh, on the afternoon when we all come home and turn on our ACs. So we're very short-sighted, uh, short-minded, uh, myopic in this with terrible consequences. Um, then uh, cultural values and political orientation play to, plays a huge role and Gavin has alluded to this. Uh, uh, the whole climate change debate has been politicized um, very extremely. Um, one example of our research, uh, a graduate student, David Hardesty, has um, done a study where he showed that uh, how important it is uh, how we frame an issue. Um, for instance, um, public support for CO2 uh, regulation varies greatly for Republicans and Democrats uh, when it is labeled as a carbon tax or a carbon offset. So uh, even if people are told that the, um, um, that the revenue from both of these programs will be used for the exact same thing for education, investment in renewable energies, uh, etc. So the more liberal respondents um, did not discriminate between the two labels. They were equally in support of a carbon tax or a carbon offset. But the uh, more conservative individuals strongly preferred the carbon offset uh, to the carbon tax. 
So just this minor detail in label um, triggered uh, positive or negative responses and um, Republican or self, uh, people who reported themselves as being oriented or being members of the Republican Party um, were happy to accept a carbon offset but not a carbon tax. Um, then uh, people's goals matter greatly in their decision making and um, self-interest versus collective interest is uh, a big issue when it comes to climate change and in terms of changing behavior. Um, Climate change mitigation is very often associated with personal sacrifice um, or perceived as detrimental to economic growth. So um, people face a dilemma between their self-interest and the greater good for society and the environment in the long term. Uh, and I'll go into an example of how we might be able to overcome uh, the uh, self-interest uh, for the sake of collective interest in just a minute. Um, but it's important to notice that people have multiple goals and very, conf very often conflicting goals. So if we can tap into uh, people's ability to, uh, to, to motivate their like, collective interest uh, and their social goals, environmentally uh, uh, associated goals, uh, we can be very successful. We have to tap into uh, a variety of goals that people have. And, um, the uh, last barrier that I will talk to um, about is communication and processing of information. And um, a typical abstract science communication doesn't seem to motivate uh, people to take action uh, because most people don't turn these abstract images uh, such as, and where did they go? No? Okay, I think those images aren't there. I had the uh, Mona Loa curve and um, uh, climate change projections uh, up to the year 2100. Um, I thought I had him on my slide. Um, and the, people can't wrap their minds around uh, these projections. It's too abstract. Uh, people, and people do not elabor elaborate on them, not because they're lazy or they don't have the cognitive capability. It's just we humans try to do as little as possible when it comes to processing information. Um, also, we have very we're very selective in the information that we want to process. Uh, we try to find confirmation for what we already believe and try to build information into our existing mental models of how the world works. And if you believe in climate change, you will try to find information that confirms this. If you don't believe in climate change, uh, you, will, you will neglect information and uh, that, would, that would show you otherwise. Um, so I'll now run th quickly through um, a couple um, studies and examples of how we can uh, improve our communication to change behavior. Um, let me use water management as an example of an environmental decision. Um, um, and summer is coming up and many counties uh, and uh, cities are starting, will start to put up um, water conservation messages. Um, and people can either uh, decide that they want to water their lawn or they can decide to comply with these, uh, uh, with these policies. Uh, and they end up either with a beautiful uh, golf course-like lawn or they end up with this. Now, um, one, um, one of our graduate students, now postdocs, um, Poonam Aurora, uh, had observed the following in a New York uh, county. When the larger county sent out a letter to encourage people to preserve water, um, there was very little response. When the village sent out a letter, compliance went up. Now, one explanation for this is probably the increased affiliation that people felt with the village, uh, whereas the county was too big of a unit to send out this letter. So the village has known others, whereas the county has unknown others. So based on this anecdotal evidence, um, uh, Punam Aurora designed a, a lab experiment um, to measure the effect of social goals, and in particular, the level of aff affiliation the, the effect that le the level of affiliation has on cooperation. Um, we are in a study with four-person groups, analogous to four large greenhouse gas emitters, um, and played a game where there's a financial incentive to defect. Uh, this is a typical commons dilemma. Um, she created four different levels of group affiliation, ranging from an anonymous group. These people only knew there are other members in the group. They didn't see these people. They weren't necessarily in the, they weren't in the same room. Um, the next group uh, had a shared symbol. They knew they are a member of the yellow star group. They didn't see 
the other group members, but their paperwork had a yellow star marked on the upper right corner. Um, then there was a co-present group where people sit in the same room together, but they're not allowed to interact, but they do see each other. And the fourth level of affiliation was created by a co-present group, which worked on one unrelated task prior to playing the game. And in this case, um, we asked students to come up with a topic that they feel strongly about, that they should write about to the dean. And the group had to write this letter. They had like 15, 20 minutes. The letter was actually submitted to the dean, and the dean's probably still reading all of these. And, um, and then the group played this um, uh, Comets Dilemma game after they had worked together. So four levels of, um, of affiliation. Um, and I just uh, mentioned these students did not know each other at all beforehand. These were uh, students from, from all over campus. So in this experiment, we found that as affiliation increased, so did cooperation. Um, affiliation made social goals uh, and concern for others a greater priority. Um, the added benefit of cooperation made up for the sacrificed money that people left on the table. Um, so in this case, um, in, in game theoretical terms, uh, we can say that uh, a common dilemma can be transformed by social goals to a payoff structure with uh, multiple equilibria. So an experiment, in this experiment this worked even though students had these temporary affiliations, they didn't know each other beforehand and they were not committed to doing anything uh, with each other ever again. So the implications of this are, like, if we want to promote cooperation, we have to activate social goals in people. And we can do that by integrating the social and the economic goals. And by emphasizing this umbrella affiliation, uh, an affi uh, umbrella aff affiliation of players. Um, so targeting these social goals and concern for others will result in very different decisions than if economic goals are, um, are put at the forefront. Um, the second example, um, oh, here's my slide with the uh, Mona Loa curve and the variation in the Earth's temperature over the past 1,000 years. Um, information has been presented in this way um, does, not, um, does not generate a lot of fear or anxiety about climate change uh, unless you, maybe you're Gavin Schmidt and you work with this all the time. Um, so unlike the audience here today who obviously cares about climate change, most people don't seem to have responded well to this form of, of information. Um, it requires analytic processing, it requires time, uh, experience, um, uh, at a minimum interest. Um, and for a long time, people have uh, thought that like, um, the reason why people have not responded to climate change information is because there was an information deficit and we need to provide more information so that people um, will finally take action. Um, however, um, the reason why this information does not engage people is uh, uh, people can't relate to it and it's too abstract, it's too distant. Um, so to explain a little bit like how we process information, um, humans rely on two processing uh, systems and uh, they, are, they interact, they work in parallel, they interact, uh, but for um, clarity uh, sake, we have separated them into this rational analytic system and a more experience-based emotional affective system. Um, and the analytic system, analytic, logical, deliberative, uh, it encodes reality in abstract symbols, words, and numbers. Um, rules and algorithms need to be learned. This is not hardwired. And the system needs to be queued. It does not operate automatically. So this system is the one that needs to be activated in order to process the typical science IPCC style um, information. On the other side, the emotional affective system is based on experiences that we have. It's holistic, intuitive, um, it's affective. Uh, risks, are seen, risks are translated into feelings. Risks uh, represent fear, dread, anxiety, uh, etc. And this system encodes reality in concrete images, um, in narratives, um, and it's linked in our associative um, uh, networks. It operates automatically, it's uh, without training, it's uh, response much faster. So if the two systems are in conflict when making a decision, usually the decision is dominated by the affective emotional system because it 
reacts so much faster. Um, this table can easily be also uh, illustrated with this uh, uh, illustration um, where I don't think I need to explain this. Um, similar to um, um, what, what, I, what, what I'd like to point out what experience can do for us, for instance, this is an example of like someone who has recently experienced a flood, um, will be much more likely to, uh, to be afraid of the next flood and will actually be overestimating the risk of any next flood. That's what experience can do to us. Similar to personal experience, uh, second-hand experience um, can help people relate and can create an interconnectedness between us and the larger world. This is a village chief in an Alaskan village um, who um, in, uh, in a series of videos and, um, and documentaries explains how life and culture has been influenced by um, uh, global warming in his village. Um, sorry. Now, um, if this um, emotional uh, system is so powerful, um, why are we not using this uh, more effectively? Why aren't we, why aren't we um, uh, changing all of our climate change information? This information, we have this knowledge, we know that emotions uh, are a, a wellspring for action. And why are we not using it? Um, to raise attention, to lead to stronger engagement with an issue, and um, to motivate action. Well, um, there are downsides to overusing the emotional side. Um, because we have uh, only a finite pool of worry. And this is illustrated in this, um, in this slide, uh, where uh, we might worry about global warming after attending this lecture, but tomorrow morning, uh, if your company or your spouse's company announces that they are downsizing, uh, you're much more worried about that, even though the state of the global climate has not changed in the last 24 hours. So we can only worry about so many bad news um, at a time. And, um, and in addition to uh, not being able to worry about so many things at the same time, it's like we, can, we, can, uh, we find that there's a numbing to uh, overuse of emotional appeals. So people are starting to be very tired of seeing the polar bear because they feel it's like, well, we have seen this over and over again. It doesn't trigger the same response anymore than when, when the polar bear became the poster child of climate change in the first place. Okay, here we go. Um, what I would suggest then is um, a combination of the emotional and the analytic appeal. And um, here we have a slide of some 20 uh, time series of glacial retreat across the world. Um, and for most people, this would not be uh, very uh, uh, interesting. Uh, it would actually turn many people off. Um, if we want to get people engaged, uh, we should focus in on one of the time series and pick one point and see this is what this glacier looked like at point X, at time X. Uh, then we look at like there was an 800 meter retreat in length of this glacier. What does that look like? Try to show a photo. Uh, there are lots of photos available now for a lot of these um, glaciers uh, that you can put together and can show what it actually looks like when a glacier retreats. Uh, and then you can, you can go through multiple of these glaciers and, and try to show that. Um, the information will never be as comprehensive as the time series, but you have, to, you have created a way for people uh, to want to know more what happened to this glacier. You can then ask uh, an elderly person who has been around for 80, 90 years to explain their experience with living near this glacier. Um, you can explain the impact of glacier retreat on agriculture downstream, uh, or you can explain the impact on children's on water availability and children's health in regions that are um, uh, downstream from glaciers. At that point, you may have people's attention so that they actually want to know why are glaciers retreating, and you can show CO2 emissions, how they have risen, and how they will continue to affect uh, temperature uh, increases around the globe. So this combination is probably is one way um, to get. Uh, to raise attention and to get people uh, much more engaged. Um, now, let's assume for a minute that we have uh, created this great attention, people are willing to change their behavior, uh, and they want to know what can we do. 
um, very often we run then into this problem that people change their light bulb, which is a great thing. It's very important. Uh, a lot of people do it, but they stop. That's all they do. They feel good about it. Their sense of vulnerability, the feeling of risk has been reduced by taking one action and they don't, people don't have the urge to do anything else. Um, this is something that uh, uh, is found across the board. We found this with research with uh, farmers uh, in Argentina, with farmers in Florida, uh, who invest in one form of adaptation to climate variability and do not uh, follow a whole portfolio of actions that would be necessary um, in order to, uh, to build a full uh, comprehensive strategy to deal with climate variability, similar with climate change. This has also been found um, actually in medical decisions where radiologists who are looking at, um, at images, they find one abnormality and stop looking for more because they feel like they have identified a problem. And this has nothing to do with IQ, uh, obviously, and it's just a, it's a, it's a problem um, of uh, attention and, and cognition and uh, obviously very serious. So um, what can we do uh, about this? We can provide checklists for people that they can follow so they take more than one action. Um, it doesn't always work. Um, if we know that people only take one action, we should try to promote the most uh, powerful action or the, the, the action or behavior that has the greatest potential for saving energy or um, for mitigating climate change if we know that people only do one thing and that's one other solution how we could deal with this. Um, let me conclude. Um, from what we've learned we can easily take a pessimist view. We constantly make decisions that are not good for us. Uh, we ignore others in our decision making um, and um, we don't choose what would ultimately be uh, good for us in the long term and for the environment. Another problem is that there's no one size fits all. So how are we going to deal with this? Like every different audience needs a different approach. Every country needs a different approach. Every sector, like the health sector, agriculture, um, water management need different approaches. You're dealing with different stakeholders. Um, so it can be very frustrating. What can we do about that? Um, there's a big difference between uh, um, encouraging uh, New Yorkers to change to compact fluorescent light bulbs uh, compared to uh, uh, reducing deforestation in, uh, in the Amazon where we have thousands of stakeholders in countries that are extremely poor uh, with uh, weak institutions. Um, but I like to take the optimist view uh, and I feel that we can improve the communication of climate change. We, there's, there's a lot that we can do. Um, and Good behavior can be learned. A lot of our studies show that. If we, if we motivate the um, uh, uh, cooperation and appeal to social goals in people and appeal to regard for others, um, we can achieve cooperation and um, people will sacrifice some of the economic uh, interest for the social and environmental interest. And um, if we involve stakeholders very early on in, through participatory processes, we can help tailor the information. And I think that is a key that we need to be uh, in tune uh, and in contact with our audiences very early on so that we find out what do people need to know uh, so that we can create information that matters to them and that they can then follow. Um, if you want to learn more about uh, our research and how it can be applied to climate change communication, we created this guide over the last three years. Uh, it's available at this website. I also have uh, several copies here um, if you're interested in taking some with you. Thank you. Alrighty, thank you. I think now we'll take questions for the panel and you could start with anybody you'd like. And can you go up to the microphone please? Uh, yes, thank you. My name is Phil Quinn. I'm from Australia, if you haven't worked out already. Um, I will start with a rather depressing observation. I worked on the government's, Victorian government in Australia's uh, water plan communications during a 13-year drought. And one of the things we discovered was that the closer people were to the epicentre of the drought, the less likely they were to believe in climate change. Uh, the closer they were to the inner city, 
um, in the, in the uh, Labor, or I should say here, Democratic Party voting suburbs, the more likely they were to believe in climate change. Uh, in both Australia and the US, climate change has descended into a partisan battleground, despite the hope, I think, earlier on that it would be a unifying issue around which science, science and the broader community could engage without getting their hands dirty. We now know that's not going to happen. So how do you think we can best, most effectively, target that audience uh, who are gettable? Not the people who believe that Obama's the Antichrist, and not the people that believe already that climate change is a serious issue that needs addressing. How do we target? I didn't hear anything about targeting today. So that's what my question relates to. So the study that I referenced out of the Yale Law School talks specifically about that, and a number of people around the country are talking about that. Um, I imagine you might be collaborating with Ed Maybach and Tony Lezowitz. And so people are talking a lot about how do you target influential people in communities. And Dr. Marx referred to the fact that when the village sent out a message, it was more influential than when the county sent a water conservation message. And that, I suspect, has to do with affiliation, community size, and who you respect. So targeting is about identifying the people who are respected in different communities. And uh, the issue of whether or not they are vocally saying Obama is the Antichrist is a little bit irrelevant if they have decisions to make about their crops or their insurance premiums or something that touches their lives. And I think that what a consensus is emerging, or at least there is an emerging understanding that um, rather than talking directly about climate change, and it's always about climate change, you can talk about the ways that uh, complex environmental systems and their problems are manifestations of systemic processes that have other ties in to people's livelihood. And I think that that is something that is emerging and growing as an idea, and I, and I suspect that you'll see more and more not NGOs kind of taking that stance, but I can also say that working within NOAA, there's a lot of interest in how do you work with different communities of people, some of which may not give a, may not care about science per se, but the impacts are important to them. Can I yeah. jump in? Um, I, I, think, I think the key to what it is you're talking about is, is a realization why it is, you're, what it, why you're trying to communicate with these people and what it is that you want to communicate. Now, um, and, I, and I have to kind of pull on something that, that you said, that communication was there in order to change behavior. Now, that is a reason to communicate, but it certainly isn't the only reason to communicate. And, and I think if we talk about the goal of communication merely to change people's behavior, then I think we can quite rightly be accused of being propagandists. And that is something that your farmers in the Murray-Darling Valley are very sensitive to. They don't like being preached at, and you know they've been living their way for a long time, and they don't take kindly to people from Darlinghurst coming in and saying, hey, you guys, you, know, you should change your, your life, and we're gonna communicate in order to change your behavior, okay? It doesn't matter what it is that they're trying to communicate. Once you start off with that premise, mm. you've lost. So the, the issue uh, that, that has to, be kind of considered is, okay, if you want policies to be put in place or people to, to follow policies, you don't have to have everybody agree with the reason for that policy in order to get that policy done. There are lots and lots of overlaps that I find um, uh, all the time with people who are, you know, they'll, they'll swear blind that Michael Mann is the worst person in the world, but are perfectly happy to drive around in an electric car, right? Okay, so I don't care what their opinion is about, you know, friends of mine, but it matters whether they change their behavior. So looking for uh, overlaps where they would 
want to do something that your people in the inner city also want to do is much, much more important than getting them to change their mind about any scientific aspect, which, quite frankly, you know, um, most people's opinion about the science per se doesn't have much impact on anything. But getting policies put in place, getting people to make decisions, whether they're conscious or not, of why they're making that decision, that, that's much more important. And so uh, finding overlaps in terms of actions is much, much more important than trying to get everybody to think the same way. Also um, related to that, I would say um, identifying a person uh, of trust is, I mean, is key. Um, the other thing is like finding a context that people really care about and then uh, linking that up with the climate change problem. Um, people very often I mean, easily care about health, uh, their own health or their children's health. And if we, if we can lay out um, the multiple uh, impacts of climate change and show the linkages of health to water, to pollution, to climate change, um, people are more open to, uh, to learning more about the general problem. But I think it's, it's identifying the right frame for people to start to connect and to open a path where they allow new information to come in that they don't reject uh, right out of hand. Um, and very often we're being accused like, yeah, you just want to manipulate people so everybody becomes green. Um, there is no way not to frame an issue. It's impossible to have a neutral frame. So why not take advantage of frames that are to the benefit of people? Um, for instance, uh, this has been shown in uh, saving for retirement. No one could say it's bad to save money. Uh, you don't want to like stock all your money away, but like saving for retirement in general is seen as a good thing. And by presenting retirement savings plans in a way that make it easier for people to sign up, uh, uh, we're using this information from the decision sciences to help people make better decisions for themselves and for others. And I think with climate change, we can do it too without manipulating people uh, uh, in a way that we want people to behave. Thank you. Hi, my name is Renee Cho, and I do some writing about climate change. And um, Can you speak closer to the mic? I can't really Oh, I'm sorry. My name is Renee Cho, and I do some writing about climate change. And I was just noticing, I mean, with the weather that we've had this winter, there are so many people who have actually experienced horrible, you know, emotional upheavals and traumas from the weather. And yet I've never heard anything on the news or in the paper connect the weather or the extreme weather to climate change. And so if we're talking about people perceiving risks in terms of emotion and experience, it seems like that would be an ideal way to sort of make them connect the dots, but it hasn't happened. Do you, can you explain that? Well, the, the reason why it hasn't happened is because there isn't a connection. Um, we, we, you know, you discussed uh, attribution of, of particular events over the winter uh, that Noah had come up with, and, and I think you said one thing that was, that was very wrong. You said that that was inconsistent with what the climate models were predicting. Okay, let me okay. just jump in with that. Uh, what I was, I did misphrase it. Right. The climate models did not make that prediction. I did, oh, I did not oh, intend inconsistency. Okay. No, 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 no. Yeah. Okay. So, I'm, I'm, not, I'm not pointing out to say that you said something wrong, but I'm pointing it out to, to, to indicate that even among people who are working on this all the time, the notion of what climate science is predicting or projecting into the future is very poorly understood. Climate models are not trying to predict what's going to happen in the weather next week. Right? They can't. There's a, there's a fundamental limit to our ability to predict the weather that, that's, that's limited by chaotic dynamics, which makes anything past two weeks an impossibility. Not it's hard, not that it's going to take us a while to get there, an impossibility. And so when uh, we have weather events that come along, uh, we have a big snowstorm, we have a, a big rainstorm, we have some weird pattern. I get a call, you know, on a very regular basis from somebody at the New York Post saying, hey, is, uh, is, this, is this all about climate change? Is it, now are we seeing climate change? And I have to say, no, this is weather. There is no, um, there is no, uh, you know, nobody has ever claimed that weather stops because climate change happens, right? These are two different things. The climate change is something that's happening in the statistics, it's happening in the long-term trends, and it will become, uh, and in, in places it already has become, 
a noticeable thing that people can, you know, remember from, well, you know, how much snow did we have when we were young? You know, how many days did we have over 90 degrees when we were young compared to how we are now? Those things people notice, but they're in the statistics. The actual weather events, however extreme it is, it's a really, 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 really hard thing to attribute to climate change. So the reason why you're not hearing anything on the news with climate scientists saying, oh, say, look, extreme weather must be climate change, is because that's extremely irresponsible. Because when, that, when you start to do that, um, you say, oh, well, it's really warm this week. It must be global warming. Well, the next time it's really cold, everybody says, hey, I thought you said it was global warming, right? And so, and you get just caught into a trap. Short-term behavior is not climate change, right? Full stop. And it doesn't matter whether it supports what I'm saying that's going to happen in 50 years' time or it doesn't support what I'm saying is going to happen in 50 years' time. They're just different things. It's like, oh, okay, well, I'm, I'm kind of come up with a metaphor on the fly. Those aren't, just, those aren't generally very successful. Um, but, you know, the, the models that we have, they include weather, right? They have weather components in them. And if you looked at the, at the model, uh, you know, so I, I have a model that I run that, that, that was part of the IPCC reports and everything. And you look at what it does, then there's weather in that. There are winters that are warm, there are winters that are cold, there are Arctic oscillations that are in a very negative phase, there are Arctic oscillations in a very positive phase. Over time, there's an increase in the Arctic oscillation towards a positive phase, which is the opposite of what we saw this winter. But there is weather, there are El Ninos that occur. Right? It's not that what happened now was unpredicted by climate models. It's that what happened this winter is not the same as what we're trying to predict with the climate model. We're trying to predict the long-term trends. And the weather component is, is not something that we can deal with. Right? When well, we can deal with it, but it's not something that the climate models are telling us about. So, so when, when, when there's, a, uh, th there's a, an apparent conflict between a weather event and a projection for 2100, there isn't a conflict because one is a projection for 2100 in 90 years' time and the other one is a weather event that happened last week. These are not the same things. Can I take the next question? Oh, sorry. Well, yeah. well, I, mean, I, I, I just I, wanted I, to point know. out that, I mean, the point <laughs> of my examples was to really show that one of the challenges we have in establishing connection is with climate information is really getting people to even appreciate the spatial and temporal scales on which climate is even studied and understood. And so that's why we can look at climate phenomena on a seasonal basis. And I agree wholeheartedly that the attribution you do with that has to do with cycles and bigger patterns. And we study those over seasonal or decadal scales. Um, and the point of my showing the climate projection is that the best way to interpret those are as multi-decadal summaries. That's a, a, an efficient way of understanding what projections from models tell us. But I agree also that they don't tell us about weather. Establishing an emotional connection with climate issues can be a useful thing to do. For example, it, on our site, climate.gov, we have stories about effects on biodiversity. These are, so for example, we have to move loggerhead sea turtle nests, you'll find images of this on our site, because of shoreline erosion and sea level rise and increased intensity of storm surge. That is something that to get your mind really around it, you have to think in the big picture, in time and space. And that's where we're striving to get uh, people to begin thinking in terms of systems. But not, uh, I also agree with the idea, not um, responding with every weather event and attributing that to climate change. Thanks. Uh, it, I guess in the interest of full disclosure, it's, I'm Jim Mephstafiu. I'm a reporter with Bloomberg News. Um, it, it seems pretty clear that the uh, erosion, I guess, in the confidence of the science has affected the debate in Washington over policies um, and perhaps contributed to making it more difficult for, for Congress to act. Uh, so, Gavin, I'm just wondering if among the science community there's a feeling that you, you, you need to get out and try to reestablish, improve 
you, you, the credibility of climate science in some way. And if that's the case, how are you doing it? And, and if not, is it just a function of, well, you know, you're going to sit back and in five or ten years it's going to be clear that you're right anyway, so why bother? Um, so I'll, I'll, I'll challenge one premise of your question, which is that what's happened over the last three months has changed the environment in, in Washington. Uh, as far as I can tell, nobody has changed their mind because of any of this. Uh, the staffers who are asking us about, uh, you know, how various studies uh, fit into the pattern, what the role of black carbon is, what the role of methane is, uh, all these things, people are still asking us interesting questions, and they, as that hasn't changed over the last three months. Um, uh, a friend of mine just testified uh, for, the, for the Energy and Global Warming Committee uh, on, you know, uh, packages of... Uh, you know, what you would need to do to have like comprehensive climate legislation, including aerosols, including short-term gases and all this. The, the discussion on the Hill about uh, legislation at the level where the real details are worked out has not changed. Okay. So, so uh, but, but, but your, your bigger point is, is, I think, valid. And the question is, well, how, how do you, how do you um, build trust? And how do you... Uh, let people see what it is that you're doing, the process, the methodology. Uh, the issue is not about specific results. Um, the issue is not about trying to prove to somebody that the, that the trend in global mean temperature has been exactly 0.8 degrees centigrade over the last 100 years. Um, the issue is much more about can you humanize this process? Who are the people that are coming up with these things? What are they thinking about? How are they thinking about these things? And one of the ways uh, that um, I've noted that works very well is, is to just humanize the process. Who are these scientists? Uh, who are the people who are doing this work? I'm not just, you know, the five people who are always being quoted in the Washington Post or the New York Times. Um, but just, you know, the, the, the people who are doing, the, the, not, I mean, and not, it's not even the grunt work, it's, it's the real work. Um, but who aren't necessarily always in the spotlight, and in fact, d quite often deliberately avoid being in the spotlight. Where are their voices being heard? And uh, one of the things that I noted, um, so I, I, I did a book that was all about images of, of climate change and images of climate scientists. And one of the things that I noticed uh, when I give talks about that is that people really respond well to uh, stories about the scientists doing their work, stories uh, about you know, camping out on the, uh, the Arctic ice uh, for, for nine months or going down to Antarctica to, to drill in the, uh, through the ice sheets like Trevor was uh, doing uh, recently or going to uh, climbing up mountains to take, to try and get samples of trees that are being uncovered by melting glaciers or going to the tropics and finding old corals to get an idea about what El Nino did 100 years ago, 200 years ago. People really um, identify with the goals of these scientists. You know, we're trying to work out what's going on. We're trying to, trying to puzzle our way through, and we only have uh, partial data and uncertain methods, and we're still trying to work something out. People really identify with that. And so I think if we, if we bring up uh, more of those people, and we, and we say, you know, you know, we don't need to just hear from me or from Steve Schneider or from Jim Hansen all the time. We can talk to Trevor, or we can talk to... Uh, you know, other people like Peter or, or Robin or anybody else, uh, just to kind of widen it out, just to re make people realize that this is a much, much larger community than they appreciate, that the people involved are actually just trying to do their best and work out what's going on in a very complex system and remarkably are finding out things about how this system works that does translate into a better understanding. And I think showing that process and having people understand the method and the, and the process is much, much more important than trying to, you know, defend any particular result or, 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 or say that, you know, whatever temperature it was in the medieval warm period or anything like that. So, Ned or Sabine, do you have something to say on this, you know? I'm minimizing that. Right. No, I'm just, you know, <laughs> since she's the social scientist, I'd like to know what she thinks the so science the social scientists think. haven't been attacked yet. <laughs> Uh, no, I can, I can only agree with what Gavin says. I, uh, I think the idea of having um, to, to show who is behind the scientist. It's not just this voice, this, this uh, person, or this like, abstract thing, uh, as abstract as the scientist. It, it, it's not scientists say. It's 
that scientist or, or her or him or yeah. them. Let her and let her finish. Let her finish. And I think yeah, the, the, Remember? the multiplicity of scientists. I think like um, showing that within science there are also multiple views. It's not just this. Uh, we always think of this like uh, a, co a consensus. Like science itself criticizes itself. Scientists. That's how science works. Science criticizes uh, uh, other scientists. And so to show that there's, it's not just this one face, this one image of the scientist. I think uh, that's why I, I, I like uh, Gavin's and uh, Joshua Bolt's book so much, because it really tries to portray uh, the, the multiple facets of science. And I think responding um, to the attacks, um, I think we would just respond in the same way that science has been attacked, and that might not be the best way to do it. The only thing I'd just add is um, to underscore uh, something Gavin said earlier, uh, which is that scientists' job isn't reporting science to the public. Scientists do science. And I think it's our job in this room to help society understand what science is about. Hi, Taylor Dinnerman, Space Review. Um, earlier this year, the administration canceled the uh, NPOSE program, the uh, National Polar Orbiting Environmental Sensing Satellite. And uh, their, the replacement for it is a uh, joint uh, um, polar orbiting science uh, satellite that's going to be, uh, get the military out of it and is going to be strictly a NASA and NOAA project. And I'm just wondering, um, this new satellite using all the, uh, some of the previous technology, is this provide an opportunity to put some instruments on it that, or sensors on it that could really engage the public? Because satellite imagery has, of course, been used by both sides of the debate. And I'm just wondering um, how vital this a new forms of satellite spa of space based imagery could be I'll, I'll take that one because my expertise is actually the poles and I actually have a one of the real problems with the polar regions is that the satellites that have been watching how and have been documenting the change in the poles are going out of commission currently so we're likely to be blind for the next couple of years I actually have a team who's up in um, Greenland right now in a DC-8 flying the tracks that the satellite would have. Now, it sounds, I'll get back to your what satellites are going up, but what's remarkable is actually an opportunity because when we can get closer to the ice sheets, we can, instead of what the satellites do is they show us how or how fast the ice sheets are changing, but they don't let us look through them. They don't let us look at the bottom. So what this uh, gap in the satellite coverage is providing us is a chance to actually go look in more detail to try and answer the questions of how and why the ice sheets are changing, to get back past being able to just say they're dropping tens of meters a year at the edge, but actually look in that very difficult place to image underneath so we can understand what the physics are, so we can feed them to people like Gavin who make these large models so the models will be better. So that's one thing is that there's actually a there is a gap right now in looking at the polls for um, the most recent budget that just came out has several new satellites, including the uh, follow-on for GRACE. So I think it's actually looking very good in the long run for watching the polls. And the question will be, can we get past what you're after is some, and what Gavin and um, Sabine have said is that images are very important for communicating and how can we get back, how can we capture images? that will convey change. And I, some of that may come back to actually having people explain it as much as the data and the imagery. All right, um, can I add yep, a little bit to that? Uh, the things that have come out of satellite imagery that have a, a very strong resonance are the, the long-term records. Now, a long-term record when you're talking about satellites inevitably involves multiple satellites, right? Because they don't last that long. They last at best, you know, four, five, six, maybe seven years, maybe eight years. Uh, but it's a harsh environment, and, and you keep needing to replace them uh, in order to, to get a long transient. And one of the big kind of structural problems that we have 
in the way science is funded and the way satellites are funded um, is that uh, NASA is much more fond of doing something new and crazy and, uh, and, and fantastic uh, than it is in maintaining long-term operational uh, measurements of, of various things, which they think, oh, well, that's just Noah's job. <laughs> um, and Noah doesn't like to be seen just as like being, you know, the, the, the just kind of the hand-me-down um, satellite operator after NASA has finished playing with its toys. And so there's a bit of a, a miscommunication that happens there. I work for NASA, so I, I know something about this. Um, the things that have worked really well with satellite imagery, uh, for instance, the, the trends in sea ice in the Arctic over since 1979, uh, those have been very clear, they've been very powerful. Uh, the collapsing uh, ice shells in the Antarctic Peninsula, which were captured uh, by, um, uh, by visual imagery uh, very, very clearly. Um, the, but it, the but it's interesting because those primarily capture something that's not directly related. It's an image, not a direct piece of data. I think that's a bit of a philosophical distinction. Well, <laughs> An image is data, it's numbers. That ice was floating already. Well, I'm not yeah. disputing yeah, the no. fact that the ice was floating, but there was a big change. That ice yeah. sheet had been there for 10,000 years, and then it disappeared in three weeks. Right? I think that's something that people... Re right, re right. It it resonates it's, with it's, people. A, it's a strong communication. Right, so that, it, that's what we're talking about. Right. But, and I'm just reminding you it's communication, not um, the same as data. Well, no, there was lots of data there. How does, how does something like that happen? Right? There's, there's information in the images about the melt ponds that, that arose, about how the cracks propagated. All of those things are interesting information to people mm -hmm. looking at ice shelves. Mm -hmm. So, okay. Um, can... anyway, next. <laughs> we, we can... My name is Richard Morgan. I've assisted uh, Dr. James Hansen in, um, with research in his last two reports to Congress and also his recent autobiography, uh, Storms of Our Grandchildren. And uh, one thing that's been conspicuously absent, because uh, it's one of the things that I've had great interest in uh, lately, is that the fact that the uh, energy industry has put uh, tens of millions, and in fact, hundreds of millions, <laughs> into uh, what at best, uh, at least can be described as propaganda, uh, I think at worst can, and more accurately, uh, be described as lies to the American people and to the people of the world about global warming and <coughs> all its scientific aspects. Um, we've been through that, for instance, and I stopped counting at a half a billion on clean coal at a point um, when there was one clean coal facility in the world in Germany. Finally, the accident in Tennessee cleared that nonsense up. Um, and also, above and beyond that kind of money by the industry to, I feel, lie about uh, climate change. There's, we've been through an eight-year period of the uh, marriage of the energy industry uh, with government. And uh, in NASA, Noah, there's been suppression of the truth, editing of documents. Do you want to get to the questions? Okay. The question is, wanted. until the money's taken out uh, of, uh, and its influence, um, both in the government and in the media, do you think we can arrive at the, at the truth about, and the American people can, can arrive at, a, 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 at the truth about global warming? Sabine, you want to take that one? I would like to take all the CEOs of like, the big energy sector um, and put them in a room and run our experiment with them and try to <laughs> motivate their um, social goals. And um, I think in each of them, there is also a father or um, a person who, goes, uh, who attends a, a religious group uh, who cares uh, uh, for others. If we can tap into those parts in the people who make decisions and people who lobby and to people um, who, uh, who control uh, the money, uh, that would be great. Um, we have, I have not found access to them, but I think they, uh, I don't think it's completely um, um, hopeless. I think um, if we have to find a way to reach people um, so that they 
see the downside of um, the self-interest, short-term self-interest. Um, and again, I think it's a very difficult group to reach. And um, but if we can, if we can't reach them, uh, if we can reach enough others uh, who will then put pressure uh, on their leaders, that uh, that might be a way a way to do it. Um, but it, I think it's a, it's a really big obstacle. I, um, it's, that's not an easy solution. I've endorsed that idea. I, I mean, I've been thinking about that too, uh, a way to get these folks in a room and an experience and give them this shifted perspective, uh, that immersive visualization, but also carefully crafted narrative mm -hmm. can really facilitate people having these, these shifts and realizing that it is one earth system. Regardless of your short-term profit motives, we are all connected in the decisions that you're making. And I think that there is power through the social motivations that Dr. Marx described. Um, can we get the truth out? I think it, that's happening. I think that the science of, I think uh, that the science of climate change science is being um, given to the public remarkably freely. Um, and, and we owe a debt of thanks to Earth, si Earth System scientists for continuing that work. And it's up to us to read it and take note. I think we have time for another question. Yeah. Hi, my name is Jessica Rosen and I'm a master's student in the Climate and Society program here. Uh, one of the main goals of which is communicating climate science, so I'm always interested in these discussions and I have to run off to class in a couple minutes, but Sabine, <laughs> you, um, talked about the barriers um, to this issue, one of which, the first one being uncertainty. I have a really hard time buying that one or just understanding it because we make decisions based on uncertainty all the time in our investments and when we purchase insurance and when I have devoted my life to this program when the, there is no job market yet for it. <laughs> and so why for this issue um, is the uncertainty such a problem? Yes. Um, very good question, and I think it's something a question that we have uh, tried to um, to tackle, trying to figure out what is so different about environmental decisions and uh, uncertainty about climate change. And one is it, it is an unprecedented problem. Uh, we don't have a lot of analogies that we can refer to where we where we find examples of how we have decided uh, uh, before. Um, it's also a much more global problem than um, the decision like, you know, should I enroll in a program that will cost me $100,000 <laughs> and will I have a job afterwards? Um, that decision doesn't affect, um, it affects you and your family and, and, and your surroundings, but it doesn't have an effect on uh, the globe at large. No. So that's, that's a difference. Um, uh, it's also different from some of the health-related decisions, which also, most of them affect us personally and, and our families. Um, and not necessarily our health decisions don't have an effect on, on the globe. So that makes it, makes it a little more difficult, I think, it's the scale and the scope of it. Um, but even in the decisions um, that we make daily, um, we, we go back and forth on our decisions. We deliberate, we, uh, we weigh the pros and cons. Um, uh, you didn't just, like, out of a gut feeling, apply for, for, your, for this program at Columbia University. So uh, you, you discussed with others. Um, so those decisions are, um, they, they aren't as easy um, as we sometimes think they are. And I think um, we, if, we can, if we can tell people, like, we make decisions under uncertainty and we have ways to make them. Um, like choosing um, a surgery um, versus some other treatment um, to, to treat a disease. Um, we do weigh the options and we come to conclusions. And if we can teach people that, well, Climate change uncertainty, it might be greater uncertainty, but there is a way to tackle the uncertainty and that we can make decisions and the, option, the solution is not to make no decision. So I think we can, we can build on some of that, like we have experience with uncertainty, uh, but climate change does, is, has different components and it is at a different scale. So I don't think it can, uh, we can just simply translate decision making under uncertainty from a financial health context to, uh, to the climate change context. I, I, I agree with you. I, I think that this um, fetishization of uncertainty is uh, much more of a debating tactic 
then it is a fundamental barrier to actually doing anything. Um, the stimulus package, which was a trillion dollars worth of stuff, was not done in the certainty that that was going to fix the problem. Uh, much, much smaller investments uh, in, in renewables, in carbon pricing or whatever, um, they're not going to, uh, they're much smaller than that and the uncertainty is actually much less. So it kind of, I, th I, think, I think the uncertainty discussion resonates partially because people have a very, um, not in this room of course, uh, but, but outside, uh, people have a very uh, skewed idea about what scientists do. Right? The, the public perception that scientists are the people with the answers and that they pop up at the end of the, mo at the movie to say, oh, well, obviously that wasn't going to work. You know? um, or uh, you know, we wander around in lab coats, give people instant uh, DNA analyses and tell people, oh, well, there's obviously that person there. Um, that isn't what we do. Uh, science is, is, is fundamentally about uncertainty, quantifying it, reducing it, but it's never making it go away. Everything that we do in science is always about uncertainty. You know, even um, general relativity is not certain. Right? It's a pretty good, you know, even quantum electrochromodynamics is not certain. It's very good, but it's still not 100%. Right? Nothing is ever 100%. And so I think it's much more important that, that when these kinds of issues come up, and say, oh, we're so uncertain that we, we just try and break the link that people have between science and certainty, which I think kind of just kind of bubbles under a lot of people's subconscious. Um, and, and that's what you break. And then it doesn't become an issue. Then it's, well, how do we act in the face of uncertainty? And, and, and I think the, what you were discussing there uh, is really trying to, to move that forward. Okay, I think this will be our last question. Well, just one okay, small one, one. addition to that is that uh, I don't, I just think that the reason uncertainty sticks is that it gets at people's sense of security and insecurity about what they have and don't have. And it's not about science at all. It's an emotional response. So uh, I could go on, but we'll go on and take yeah, another question. Let's get our question. last question. Um, I'm Hannah Chang. I'm from the Center for Climate Change Law at the law school here. Um, you find that when you talk to other lawyers or other policymakers, you do end up getting pigeonholed into talking about the science because um, if you're debating about, you know, whether there should be any climate regulation, um, you know, anyone who can see the analogy you made to the building, anyone who can see the whole building, no one's going to argue that nothing should be done. If you're arguing at that level, the issue is whether or not you believe climate change is happening. So you, you talk about policy issues, but then you start arguing about the science. So. I'm wondering if you guys have sort of thoughts about how, when that happens, and you're facing another lawyer, and you're arguing about little tidbits of science you don't really know anything about, you know, genuine, genuinely grasp, how, how do you deal with that? How do you get out of that argument? Do you argue on that level, or do you, you know, change tracks? How, what use is having that discussion with another lawyer or another policymaker well, who doesn't know it? Well, I, I recommend having as little to do with lawyers as possible. <laughs> With all due respect to any good lawyers who are in the room, <laughs> which, which I'm sure you're great. Uh, but I, I've, I've been spending way too much time talking to lawyers in the last few months that uh, I can't. Anyway, the, the, the issue is, uh, you know, if somebody, if you're talking about something and then somebody brings up um, nuclear fission and you know nothing about nuclear fission, do you start arguing uh, on the basis of your understanding about what an atom is? No, right? Don't argue about things that you're not comfortable arguing about. If people, uh, if people want to insist on derailing an argument by talking about 15th century tree rings or uh, the, the process of attribution, you have to say, look, this is not my thing. I rely on the people who are doing that kind of stuff. It's in the IPCC report, take it up with them. Um, you're not an ambassador for the science. Um, and you know, you, you shouldn't feel the need to be. I mean, you should, you should read as much of this stuff and, and try and understand as much of this stuff as you want. You can ask me questions, you can email people that, that you know, with question that comes up. If somebody really wants to know an answer to, well, what, what about this, what about that, what about that? You say, well, you know what, I'm gonna, I, I work in a big institution where there are people who are absolute experts on this uh, world-class status. I'm gonna ask them and I'm gonna get back to you. Um, you're not responsible for everything that's in the IPCC report and you don't have to defend everything that's in the IPCC report. Uh, if you want to talk about
policy options, talk about policy options. Don't get derailed into technical issues that nothing, no, nothing is going to be settled by you having that argument. I usually, uh, when I get in these conversations, I direct people to realclimate.org. <laughs> <laughs> um, um, but we're part of the conspiracy. <laughs> and um, another thing that you can, you can ask uh, someone who argues that strongly, ask them, uh, what, what may, um, why do they feel so strongly about their argument? Why, why, uh, why do they feel so emotional about it? And, um, what, what, to find out what's driving them and like to get like what are they afraid of like and, and ask them like just for a second you know to take the opposite position and put themselves in in your shoes or in you know, in the opposite uh, uh, try to imagine the opposite opinion and just to to shake them out of that uh, because they seem to be stuck and not open to getting other information and um, and very often you can then find that people are they're just like it's 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 fears of someone taking away their lifestyle from them and, uh, and, and not wanting to see uh, another side that, um, that... So I think just playing a little uh, uh, role uh, game with someone, it's like, well, just for a second, we're, we're smart people, how about you take the opposite view and, uh, and see how you would argue in that case, uh, can help people just like to be thrown out of their, wherever they're stuck and being open to new information. And uh, they can still go back and argue their way, but I think just to to open up their minds for just like um, a brief moment. And so that they can themselves understand what is going on and why they are arguing a certain way. So my father's a lawyer and uh, his, uh, his class has a discussion list, uh, an email list, and I guess he's nearing retirement and feels like he has time for engaging in some of these kinds of discussions with other highly intelligent uh, people, some of whom advocate positions from from positions of relative, well, lack of expertise. And um, I've given him coaching on some of the facts, and, but I have found that his style of phrasing an argument far exceeds my own, and I suspect that we could learn a lot from lawyers about how to engage in dialectic in a way that's constructive that is respectful and that doesn't open up the pitfalls of trying to engage in the minutia of something that we're not all experts in. So I would be interested to hear what a room full of lawyers answered to that question. Let me, let me add one little postscript to, to what Sabine said. Um, one question that's, that I, I often find the answer to very interesting is when somebody's arguing with you, you say, well, where are you getting your information? Whose sources do you trust? And why is it that you think that a blog somewhere on, I don't know, somewhere on the internet is, is more uh, um, reliable than the, the assessment of the National Academy Report? And, and trying to work out where people get their information from is, uh, is, is actually very uh, closely tied to helping deal with you know, possibly false sources of information that they may have read somewhere. So that's a good tip. Ready, so I think there are no more questions. I think, thank everybody for, oh, you have one? Okay, good, here, I threw down the gauntlet. I guess you did. Hi, I'm Marcia Montero and I'm a thousand percent average. <laughs> so my, my, my point about the, this, the whole event that is communicating about uh, climate change to people in general. I think that you have to do what everybody does. Hire PR, put them in the, in the Tiger Woods <laughs> circle. If you want to really reach people, you have to do what other people do. He says all the time, oh, we are scientists, it's not our job. There's people that have the job to communicate things to other people, so use them. It's a job market out there. <laughs> That's it. I think, do you, do you want to respond to that? Um, well, I think that, well, our center is not a marketing center in a PR <laughs> firm. Um, we are um, uh, doing research um, uh, that, that helps us to identify uh, ways that will make people respond in a way that people are, uh, 
advertising and commercial works for people. And, um, uh, but when scientists start to use those tools, it's being seen as manipulation. And people don't realize that like, every day, everything that they see is being brought to them uh, in a way that is try trying to manipulate them, to sell them something. And, um, but when science does it, it's seen as uh, it's, it's subjective and, um, and science doesn't want to engage in using these tools. So I think um, doing it in more, in, in more subtle ways uh, uh, might, be, uh, might be more effective. Um, also in getting like, scientists uh, uh, excited about uh, communicating science. I think science, it's only in the last, uh, over the last few years that scientists have stepped out and like want to communicate in different ways uh, other than just in peer-reviewed journals. And it's, it's very new to scientists. Scientists are not used to that and to being in a spotlight and, uh, and most, of, most of us don't, don't like it that much. Um, that's why we're in science, I guess. Um, but I think a combination of that and uh, using the tools in a way that uh, people feel comfortable with um, would be a very good thing to do. Uh, but I don't think that we can hand um, uh, our communication over to Madison Avenue because um, actually they come to us and want to know about our research because they feel that we know more about it than they. Mm -hmm. how they, they got engaged in these things watching a film. And it's not really the same process of, of publicity or of having a PR firm, but it's a way to reach people in a subject. So if it's if not a scientific way, because it's kind of boring for us, <laughs> Ned, well, since you work, yeah, I wanted yeah, you to say something, because you work for the, yeah. the part of the gun government that's trying to explain climate, I think. Right, <laughs> yes. Um, right, we are forming something called the NOAA Climate Service. It's a um, proposal right now to Congress to yes. sort of establish something analogous to the National Weather Service around climate. But speaking directly to your point about PR and movies and popular culture, I mean, I do think you see some messaging out there right now that is focused on climate change science and policy and adaptation and the choices we can make in society that are not driven by scientists. They are driven by uh, people who have a corporate interest in making money off wind power, for example. So those messages are and will get out there. Well, I see them on, when I, I'm on the internet, for example. Does it matter for you? Well, What's the well, that matters a lot. And um, so because I work for a science agency, it's very important for us to have a communications strategy that is transparent and that serves oil and gas and wind and agriculture and education in every sector of society in a way that's transparent and egalitarian because it's taxpayer dollars paying for the information to be distributed. What I'm trying to suggest in the first part of my answer, though, is that there are commercial interests that will spin up PR around climate issues. But that is different from communicating to science. And so those people are clients and consumers of the information, just as all those other sectors I described. And hopefully we can serve all of them with the information that we can collate together about climate science. Um, and I think, though, that this gets back a little bit to Jim's question about what are we doing differently. I think we do recognize that uh, communication requires a set of skills and expertise that is distinct from doing the science. And so building that capability, and, and I am intentionally distinguishing that from PR. I just think that actually translating science into usable nuggets of information for different populations is a skill and one that is going to require professional development and career building for this generation. Um, but I see that as distinct from PR and I don't have a problem with people using PR for PR but I recognize it for what it is. And I think building a capability around communication is very important because of all the, the, the tendency in a politicized environment to appropriate information or quote it out of context or put it 
in the wrong context intentionally and then call that scientific communication. That is not scientific communication, that's manipulation. So I've given you an unsatisfactory answer. You wanna see a clear PR action, but that has to come from society. That can't come from the government telling society what to do. I mean, that's not how our government's supposed to work. That's my take on that. Okay, well thank you all for coming. I hope you've all learned something, whether it was.